Welcome grade 12s. Today we're going to be looking at the eye and the ear for your exam revision. What I'm going to start off very quickly is just to go over the exam guidelines just very very quickly as to what you have to pay attention to and then we're going to start with the questions because they're the most important part. Okay quickly let's go through your exam guidelines. When it comes to the eye and the ear I find it very important, all right? Diagrams, diagrams, diagrams. You should, on a big piece of paper or small, doesn't matter, have a diagram. Doesn't matter, you draw it yourself, you trace it. If you have a photocopy, it's fine. Of all the ear and the eye. And you label all of the structures and you put all the functions on it so that you have a picture in your head as to the structures that you're going to look at, all right? So very important, if we look at the first one, let me get my usual, oh, there we go, pink color. Right, it's very important that you are able to understand, right, and describe the structure, right, of the different parts of the eye. Right, you also need to have a bit of an idea what binocular vision is, right, specifically leading when we um, link it with evolution. I would, however, say if I had to say which is the most important, these two aspects are to me, one of the most important aspects when it comes to the eye is accommodation, all right, which we are going to look at when the distance of an object change. Don't get confused between the two. And pupillary mechanism, which is in response to the varying amounts of light. All right. So those two concepts I would deem as very, very important. Also, what you tend to... Um, go over, you don't always um, you skim over, you don't learn so much, is the visual defects, all right, of the eye. And you do have to have, all right, an idea of what short-sighted, long-sighted astigmatism and cataracts. And for each of those, what I would su suggest you do is that you have diagrams, okay? And for each of them, what I would like you to do is know why, they are like that, which usually, all right, is due to the shape of the eyeball being incorrect. All right, so know why. Usually be able to draw a diagram. If the eye is too long, it might look funny, be able to draw it. And then the second thing, where does the light fall? All right, so does it fall just in front of? at the back, Why, what is the cause of it, and then I would suggest that you know how, right, you correct it. Should your lens be concave, should your lens be convex, don't skip over those parts. Those are little things that can come into your structure, right, come into your eye, and it's, I do tend to find that some of you do tend to um, just skim over it, and that can cost you marks. When it comes to the ear, again, you need to be able to describe. First of all, you need to be able to look at the different parts. So I need to know the structure of the ear, and then I need to know the functions of each of those different parts. I've tried to bring all of these elements into the questions that we're going to look at today. Okay. When it comes to hearing, you need to be able to um, explain the pathway of hearing, all right? You also need to, when you look at the ear, you need to separate it in two parts. You need to look at the hearing side, which the word the cochlea is important, and you must differentiate that from the balance side, all right? And that is going to be your semicircular canals and your vestibular apparatus. Also link that to the brain where the hearing is going to go to the cerebrum, where balance is obviously more going to be controlled by the cerebellum. Then an, a thing that you also need to, for the ear, not a lot of detail is necessary, but you do also need to know defects, problems that are caused with the ear, and some of the terms might not be familiar with, to you. I've also tried to put questions in there today. Um, for example, middle ear infection, the word there is grommets, right? Little tubes that are put in the ear to drain the ear, and also obviously deafness, and if you do listen to like the radio, media, you'll see cochlear implants, all right, are ways in which they are then able 
to treat people who are then deaf. Okay, so as I said to you, for each of them, go through your exam guidelines and make sure you are always, you, you know exactly what is asked of you. I'm going to start off with a few multiple choice questions. I find they just start everything nicely. What they do is they, they get your mind going, get those terms going. And I'm going to go through them, put simplish ones in, just to let the, the terminology all right, start to flow for you. Question number one, okay? Which one of the following parts of the eye is the most important in refracting? Remember, refract means to bend. Okay, light from a distant object. When it comes to refraction of the eye, all right, when it the, comes the bending, the most, the, the, the part of the eye where light bending always occurs the most is going to be the cornea, all right? It says from a far distance. The cornea always bends the light and then the lens will take over from that. Okay, question number two, static balance. And again, the, when it comes to the, the um, balanced parts of the ear, right, in the semicircular canals, so I'm, I've done the three here, you see you've got over here, you have got your ampulla, all right, and over here you've got your sacculus and your utriculus. Inside there is the macula, and that has got to do with your static balance, all right, which we mean is gravity. Right, where's your ampulla, this over here, they've got to do with the position of your head. So your head changes, it's not necessarily static, the different positions of your head. Alright, so when it comes to static balance, the semicircular canals, no, alright, that is where there's more movement. So your macula, alright, in your sacculus and utriculus, that is responsible for gravity going up and down, which is a lot less movement, all right, than when we have moved the position of our head, okay? The next one is the part of the ear where, so we know we're looking at the ear, where a sound wave is changed into a vibration, right? So if we look at our diagram of our ear, our pinna, all right, where sound wave here, and we get an obstacle over there, and that is where sound is going to be changed into a vibration, and that would then be your tympanic membrane, all right, which is your eardrum. Okay, it starts, that's where the whole movement starts, the actual, you can see the vibrating. Question 1.4, this is a nice little question, I like it, you've got to think a little bit. Which one of the following parts of the body Right, are involved in helping a blindfolded man, all right, standing on one leg to keep his balance. Okay, now if you have a look here, balance should actually be your key thing. All right, I think the blindfold there is going to maybe confuse you a bit, but if he's blindfolded, right, we're going to take sight out of the question. So any organ involved in the site, right, is not going to necessarily be there. So let's start with number A, the brain, because we know the balance is the cerebellum, yes. Muscles, yes. Organ of corti, no, all right, because my organ of corti is for hearing. Okay, I don't need, all right, for the, not for the, yeah, for the hearing, I, I don't need it for my balance. My brain, I need, yes. My cochlea, no. Right, because what is the cochlea involved in? The cochlea, once again, is involved in hearing. So that is out my macula, yes, balance. Okay, number C, do I need muscles? Yes, I do. Do I need my semicircular canals? Yes, I do. So I just want to double check so it looks like it's number C, but I just want to quickly, we're always out of habit, read the last one. The brain, yes. The cochlea, oh, we see. There we go. We see the cochlea again. We know the cochlea is for hearing and not for balance. So my answer would be number C. Okay. Question number 1.5. The shape of the lens, all right, is very important. Remember, it also tells you how about refraction occurs. The shape of the lens in the human eye may be altered. Altered means to change. 
All right, so the shape can change. Remember my shape there, or we want to get it nice and fat, okay? By contraction or relaxation of the, what causes those lenses? You'll see it comes in as a question later on as well, right? The optic nerve, no, that's the impulse. Muscles of the ciliary body, okay, muscles, we know muscles do work, so yes. Muscles of the iris, we've got muscles, but what is the iris involved in? The iris is involved in the pupil, all right, and we want to know the shape of the lens. So my answer is going to be number B, all right, muscles of the ciliary body. Okay, now let's start with our longer questions. Question number two says, study the diagram that shows the anterior, that means front, and longitudinal section, all right, that's my front, that's my longitudinal section, almost what it looks like from the side of the human eye, all right, and we're going to be answering questions, okay? So we're looking at both of those are diagrams of the human eye just from different points of view, and now we're going to answer a few questions from that. Question number 2.1, identify parts numbered 1, 2, and 3, all right? So we go and have a look on our diagram. Number 1, all right, they're showing you there, and it's that little space over there. So number 1 is going to be my pupil, it's the space. And they're showing you that pupil is that area over there. So they're giving, they're showing you from the side, there's nothing there. And they're showing you from the pr front, it's that large, it looks black, but remember it's that empty space that's there. Then number two, all right, number two is that color portion, the most distinguishable portion of the eye, all right? And that is going to be the iris. And lastly, number three, Number three is pointing to these little structures, all right, over there that are on the lens, okay? So if we were to show it there, we have these which are attached to a muscle. So we have our suspensory ligaments attached to a ciliary muscle, and that whole structure is called my ciliary body. Okay, because the muscle is going to work together with the ligament to bring about the change in shape of the eye. So question number two, give the function of structure number three. Now number three, I've just said what the answer is. The ciliary body, all right, what is the function of it? Its function is to change, I'm going to go back to my question over here. All right, even if we, sorry, I'm going to actually, actually if you go back to the multiple choice, it says to you, all right, which one, which question, I'm going to go back here, all right, let's have a look at the very last question. The shape of the lens in the human eye is altered by contraction and relaxation of the muscles of the ciliary body. So we actually answered it in our multiple choice, all right. So what does it do? It changes, if you write slowly, changes the shape. Of the lens. All right, it's going to be responsible for the lens either becoming more, more, more convex or less convex. Okay, now you need to be careful for the next question. It says, name the condition responsible for, not name, all right, the structure. Name the condition. In other words, what happens, all right, for the size of structure one in the diagram. All right, so have a look over here. What is, in other words, what is number one sensitive to? And number one, that's the pupil. And what's that going to do? It's going to be either dilate, use proper terminology, or it's going to constrict when different, when we have different degrees of light. Okay, so light is going to be the condition there that's either going to cause it to dilate or to constrict. Okay, there we go. The shape of the lens in the diagram. The shape of the lens in the diagram, 
All right, so what is the condition? What, when will the lens change shape? Okay, and our answer is distance. Right, because what's that term there? Accommodation. Okay, now remember, accommodation is when something comes closer to us. So looking far away, right, that's my eyes are relaxed. But as soon as something comes closer, I have to accommodate it. In other words, I need to make a plan, right, for my lens to get fatter. So remember, far away, we need to break that image, all right, smaller, that puts in our retina. I'm going to take a quick break now. We're going to see you after this. Welcome back from your small little break. We're now going to carry on with our eye and ear exam revision questions. Okay, the first question that we, longish question that we looked at, if I'm going to just quickly go back, just remember, again, it's very important, the accommodation and the pupillary mechanism. And we're going to have a, a similar kind of question, but you'll notice the diagrams are totally different. It's a totally different way of asking almost the same thing. Okay. Here what we have is, all right, it's a data response question. A person in a darkened room is asked to cover an eye, all right? When you see darkened room, right, we already know that light, right? And when we're looking at light, what are we looking at? We know that the pupil is going to be involved here, okay? Now what happened is a dim electric bulb positioned at varying distance from the person, not all measurements, so we had varying distance, Okay, not all measurements were at different distances and it's switched on at one minute intervals for 10 seconds. All right, so we had one minute intervals and we had 10 seconds and then we moved to the next one. So we moved back, we held the light, all right, and then what happens, they kept it for 10 minutes, 10 seconds shall I say, then they moved back, they held it, all right, 10 seconds, etc. Okay. Now it says, during this period of time, the diameter of the pupil of the eye is measured. Now remember, small pupil, all right, is going to be bright light. Think about it. Large pupil, dim light. Okay, all right. So now we have in front of us a table. All right, and the first thing they want us to do is to give a heading for this table. Now, when you have a heading, all right, you always state these three things that you need to have in a heading. First of all, always state the obvious, what are you drawing? So it's a table showing, or a table of. Now, your next two very important things. I need to know both the variables, and I need to know the units in which you measured with. Which, I've got the table, so I'm going to use this right, as my cheat sheet, so to speak. So I have to put, because these are my two variables, aren't they? Time intervals and diameter of pupil. So what is this showing? A table showing the diameter of a pupil, or of the pupil, in what units? Millimeters, all right? When? So that's my first variable. Over a period of time. Isn't that time intervals? And what do I measure time in? Be specific. It's not hours, it's minutes. All right? So tell me, a table, what are my two variables? All right? Here, if you want to be specific, this is going to be, I chose my independent variable, and I did not know, right, my, the, what the pupil would, the pupil diameter would be, that's my dependent, my results. Okay, question 2.5, which structure of the eye controls the size of the pupil? Again, we had this question, all right, when we looked at the multiple choice, and it is the iris. Remember, the pupil is just a black hole, all right? It's the iris, because the iris is made up of all right, of um, muscles, your, your longitudinal and your circular muscles. OK, 
okay, circular muscles and longitudinal muscles. They're going to be responsible for either the dilation or the constriction of, right, of your pupil. Now, with a table, be prepared and you do need to, please, very important, you do make, just need to make sure that you are able to draw any kind of graph, a line, a bar, right, a histogram, a pie chart, even though some of you might not like the pie charts, you must be ready for any of the bars, okay, so any of the graphs. So here, they've said to you, plot a line graph. The most important thing is when you, all right, when we plot it, what do we put on the X and what do we put on the Y? Now, that's why I put everything up here. On my X axis, what I chose, independent, all right, and my results are on the Y axis. And if I look at the numbers, all right, I can see I don't have to go draw too much. I can actually go in up in one, two, threes, four, five, because it's not going to be too much. Okay, so the first thing I need to do is my time intervals. And my time intervals go from one to nine. And remember, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. The distance between each of those bars must be the same. So one, two, three, four, five. Then what do I do? I label it. It is time. And what do I put next to time? My units of measurement. Okay, so do I have the proper, all right, one, two, three, are my bars equal, right? Have I put down a logical numerical sequence? Have I labeled it? And have I used the given units? All right, so here was time and minutes. If I look at the back, now this is where sometimes, right, mistakes make, are made. Two, four, five. Okay, if I do it sometimes, and this, please don't do it, you write two, two, five, because that's your information. No, right? Your Y axis must have exactly the same and numeric pattern. Do I go up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight? Do I go up two, four, six, eight, five, ten, etc.? All right, it must make sense. If then you need to work in middle of it if you need to then judge the numbers. But here again, if I look at the information, two, four, five, eight, seven, I can, I think the maximum is eight. I can go up in ones. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Please take a pencil along, right, and plot in pencil, because if you make a mistake, it's much easier to erase than it is to cross out in pen, and then it gets so untidy, and then you become very unfriendly to markers, all right, because then they have to try and see what everything you have done. Okay, so there I've got, all right, my measurements are correct, they're in order, they follow numerical order. Second thing, what do I need to do? Label, all right. And there it is, diameter of pupil. Don't just tell me diameter. It could be the diameter of a soccer field, right? It's the diameter of a pupil. And what's the third thing I need to remember? Please, my units. Now, all right, now I need to give it a heading as well. But I can sort of cheat with the heading because if I have a look at my first question, my first question asked me to give it a heading. All right, now it says here a table showing, but now I have drawn a line graph. So how about I take this heading, oopsie, all right, there we go there. I take this heading and I bring it to my graph and all I do is I change the first part. Instead of saying a table, I say a line graph. And then what do I make sure I have? my two variables, all right? Time in minutes and diameter in millimeters. All right, so I'm going to use exactly, I'm going to, there we go, showing that I'm going to use exactly over there. Now when it comes for the, all right, now when it comes to the mouse, not the mouse, there I've got a picture of a mouse there, my mind goes all over the show. Starting with number one, all right, we have a look at number one, it is two. So we start here, we draw up our line, 
and we draw there and where they dis dissect, please use your ruler for each of your plotting points. It's much more accurate. Right, at number two, at time interval number two, it was four. All right, and you're going to do that from one all the way, all right, up to number nine. When you are finished, all right, you then are going to join the dots. Do not join it to the y-axis because naught, all right, was never one of your numbers. You start at number one and you join it and you go, you can use a ruler, okay, and you join each of the plots together. Okay, now from that, so let's have a look from your graph. You now ask question number 2.7. You can also use your table to double check that your answer is correct. It says here, between which two measurements? So you have to give two numbers, all right? Which two measurements? Second of all, it's a measurement, so I need to know the units, all right? Very important, I need to know the units. Does the change in diameter of the pupil occur the largest decrease in other words where all right did it go from the highest from a line a, a, a diameter a large diameter to all right so we went from a large and or to an even smaller diameter so if we have look we went up here so it's not that we went up here not that Stayed the same? No. Stayed the same? No. Went down one? Yes. Because what am I looking for? Look at my question. The largest decrease. Where did it go from decrease difference from a larger to a smaller one? Where was the biggest change? All right. So here I've got eight to seven. Here I've got seven to three. So four all right, many meters there. Three to one, okay, two, and then it went up again. All right, so it went, so I'm not, don't want an increase, I want the decrease. So now, between which two, look here, wherever I put my four between, between minute number six and minute number seven, and I want between which two measurements. Okay, between which two measurements did it happen the most? All right, between the time intervals were six to seven, all right, and it was between seven and three. So where did the diameter of the tip between the six and the seventh minute? That was where the largest change occurred. Okay, then question eight, they need you to think a little bit here. It says, why did the diameter of the pupil remain the same, right, during the third and the fourth intervals? Between here, why did it stay at five, right? And come up with a logical, what, if you assume something, come up with something's logical, right, and go for the light. Why would it stay the same? Because, right, what happened? Do you think they moved it? Do you think they changed? Because they said, if you go and look all the way up here, it says, not all measurements were at different distances. Not all measurements. We did not measure distance here. We measured time. So what we could have done, we could have used the same distance twice. So if we have a look at why do you think the diameter stayed the same, Quite simply, because the distance did not change. All right. They say to you there that in brackets, you need to read your introductions. Right. And it gave you an example over there. Okay. We're going on to, all right, the next question. If we look at the question, question number three. Right? It's pretty much similar to question number two, but having a look at the diagrams again, you might say it looks a little bit complicated, but actually it's not if you just concentrate on the labels. 
It says study diagrams one and two, and here are diagrams one and two. And it says that illustrate the lens. So they're telling you that that is the lens, that is the pupil, all right? And then it shows you different layers around that. Now, if we look at the lens, right, what do we look at? If we look at the structure of the lens, only certain structures attach to the lens. And we know that they are going to be my suspensory ligaments and my ciliary muscle. Right, so keeping that in mind now, muscle, let me put there, muscle. Keeping that in mind now, let's see if we can answer the questions. Okay, there's a graph beneath as well, but we're going to get to the graph when we look at the different questions. First of all, it asks you to identify parts A and B. Don't get confused saying cornea and all of those things. It says, this is the lens, all right, and the structures join to the lens. So, what would these be? And if you look at the next diagram, you notice they become loose, right? So that should tell you, right, that number B is going to be my suspensory ligaments. All right, because doesn't that attach to the lens? All right, let me go over there, my suspensory ligament. Then, over here, these... All right, is a different structure. What are my suspensory ligaments joined to? Number A must be my ciliary muscle. And that's why I've done it in the different colors. Because if we look at it from a different point, what attaches to the lens? My suspensory ligaments. And what attaches, what causes them to become taut or to slacken? My ciliary muscle, because they're my ciliary body. Okay. Which diagram shows part of the eye where the ciliary muscles are contracted? Right, when my ciliary muscles contract, remember they move forward. And what happens to the ligaments? They become slackened, all right? They become loose. So that's going to be diagram number two, all right? Then the next question, under dim light conditions. So now we don't have to, looking at light, we don't have to look at the suspensory ligaments. We have to look at the size of the pupil. In dim light, the pupil must get bigger to get more light in. And we can see, look at tiny little pupil over there and a bigger pupil over there. So diagram one, all right, is going to show me, here we go, under dim light, it's going to be diagram one. Okay. Now it asks you question 3.3, explain your answer, all right, in 3.2, number one. How do you know, all right, that the ciliary muscles, why is it that diagram? And remember what I said to you, all right, why is the, is the, um, how do we know that it is in when the, when the muscle, when we're looking at something, all right, if we have a look over here, we're looking at something, the ciliary muscles are contracted. And we know that the ciliary muscles are contracted because when the ciliary muscles contract, what happens? Our suspensory ligaments, there we go, slacken. Or you can maybe say they get less taut. Okay? Not taut. Taunt is when you are taunting at somebody, making, all right, funny little horrible mistakes. Taut. All right, so that is why I explain. How do you know? If you can see from the diagram, all right, if you can see the suspensory ligaments aren't as tight as they are in diagram one. Okay, now when we look at question number 3.4, and I made this mistake initially myself as well. The next question says, which letter on the graph? All right, I, when I first did it, all right, went and looked at the eye. Because we, we're so used to looking at the diagrams of the eye. And remember, the graph is also there. Okay. The question shows you the change in the shape of the lens. And what they want from this question is which letter on the graph indicates each of the following. All you had to do is write the letter. The eye looking at a nearby stationary object. Nearby must mean close. So the lens must be convex. And when we say stationary, all right, there should be no movement. OK, 
Okay, so we don't want to look for any kind of, mustn't go up or down, any kind of movement showing. If we have a look here at our graph, so we're looking at the most convex and we're looking at where it is stationary. All right, so my answer is going to be number D. All right, number D. There we go. Now the next question. Listen carefully. The eye looking at an object moving towards, moving towards, so it's moving. So we're looking at something that was, okay, less convex and it is becoming more convex. It is becoming fatter. So let's have a look. What do we want? We want, we want to go from least convex to most. Least convex to most and that is again going to be number, all right, that is then going to be number F. What should I say? Letter F. All right. Now the last question, 3.5. Explain the significance of the elastic lens. In other, wise, in other words, why is it important? Okay, why is it necessary for my lens to be elastic? Okay, what, what does it do? Number one, all right, we can see objects, okay, that change distance, okay, distance, it's really far to near, right, what else do we need it for? We need it to bend or refract light, all right, so that what happens? that it will eventually land on the retina. Okay, now that we have completed the questions on the eye, we're going to take a quick little ad break, and I'll see you back on questions with the ear. Welcome back from your small little break. We're now going to look at questions on the ear. All right, when it comes to the ear, Again, structure, mostly about hearing, all right? And then we're going to just do one or two questions on um, problems, defects that the ear can, all right, we can see when we have a look at the ear. Question number four is quite a simple, straightforward diagram. We have a diagram of the ear, and we're going to please answer the questions below. All right, question 4.1 asks you simply label structures B and structures number C. I'm going to put them on the diagram, it's much easier. Number B, we know, is our tympanic membrane. Try and learn, all right, that word rather than eardrum. And number C, all right, is over here, and remember you've got two windows, the oval window where the stirrup attaches, and this is the round window, right, where all the excess sound waves. Are going to filter through. Okay, question 4.2. Make an X on the diagram to indicate the region where fluid pressure waves can cause the cilia to bend for the sensation of hearing. In other words, it's a very long sentence and asks you, where do you hear? And when it comes to the ear, all right, that X marks a spot it is the cochlea, all right? My cochlea is the region of the ear where I hear. My semicircular canals are the region for balance. Okay, then it asks you number 4.3, what type of secretion, all right, not excretion, secretion, so it's a substance that I make that it is in part A, all right, and all of you at some stage, all right, have dug in your ears. That's going to be, we can have two words for it, cerumen or wax, and it wants to know what is the function of it. All right, and there's a few functions. It hydrates the ear, all right, keeps it moist. It's an insect repellent, all right. It also acts as an antibacterial. So there are a few things, right, that you can use for the, for the ask you again, please, all right explain the function, sorry, what type of secretion, so we said our wax, all right, 
and why is it formed there. In other words, what is its function? It must have a function for it to have been necessary for your ear. Question 4.4, explain the function of part F. Now remember, you need to know, all right, your diagrams to know, your, your labels to be able to know what number F is. And number F is leading from the cochlea, and it is the nerve. All right, the auditory nerve. And what does it do? It's going to, it says, explain the function. It carries, and this is where you need to be quite specific how you answer. It carries the impulse. All right, that's your key word. From the ear, or you can say from the cochlea, to where? To the brain. Be specific again maybe there, where you can say, the cerebrum. Okay, it's the nerve, right? It's a, it's a vestibular cochlear nerve. It's a both join, but there's one from the cochlea that's going to go to the cerebrum. Question 4.5, identify the passage. So passage is indicating that's a tube, and that's the first part, and state the function. What does it do? All right, and the fact that it's a tube should give you an idea already. Number D is my eustachian tube, all right? And what is its function? Its function is to equalize pressure, all right, between the middle ear and the outer ear, okay? It's very important that the pressure between the outer and the inner ear be kept constant so we don't have blocked ears, right? We don't have burst ear eardrums that the, uh, we can hear properly. Okay, question number 4.6. Of what substance, all right, is the part labeled G made of? Now, if you remember your ear, number G has got not enough anything to do with the ear. What do we know is part of the ear is embedded in the skull. So what substance is it made up of? It is made up of bone, right? It is made up of bone. Okay, let's get to our next question. There we go, question number five. Okay, read carefully. All the answers, right, are in the text. A mother is concerned about her one-year-old son. He cries constantly while holding his ear, right? So we know that he's probably got some kind of ear infection. He is unsteady on his feet. He has a blocked nose. He has high temperature and small yellow stains on his pillow. So what has he probably got? Pus that comes out of his, all right, that's going to come out of his, of his ear. Okay, his mother thinks he has otis media. Now we think, oh, I've never heard of that before, all right? But if you think of it, what does media mean? Media means middle, all right? And otis, imagine ossicles, the little break down the word, okay? So it says, what is otis media? So if I said to you, he cries while holding his ear, all right? Otis media probably means he has a middle ear, infection or you could have just said an ear infection all right you could have just said an ear infection that would be fine now it says give four reasons why you would support the mother's diagnosis look here he's sick all right so if he's sick he's going to have symptoms and what do we have in the text what is he going he's holding his ear we know look he's unsteady on his feet he has, I'm going to use the green, all right? There we go, one symptom. He has a blocked nose, two symptoms. He has a high temperature, three systems, symptoms, all right? He has small yellow stains on his pillow, all right? You have got, there we go, one, two, three, four, five of the symptoms, all right? They're the ones that I have circled in green. So he's sick, he's got middle ear infection, he's going to be sick, okay? Now it asks you, what can the mom do to alleviate? Alleviate means, let's go back to pink, all right? To make better, right? To make him feel more comfortable, all right? 
make him more comfortable until she can see a doctor. Okay, so what can you do? If you've got pain, read the ads. Don't you think the little girl goes to daddy? Yes, Panado, all right? You can give them medicine. All right, give them some kind of anti, all right, how can I say it? We would rather put a painkiller. There we go, that will be easier for you to remember. Painkiller, okay, painkiller, or maybe you have some eardrops. Right, just something that would alleviate the pain before, right, you take him to the doctor. Now, give two reasons why it is important to see a medical doctor if the ear infection occurs, right? What happens if we don't see it? The ear infection could get so bad, all right, we could, the ear infection get so bad that what could happen? You could lose loss of hearing. Right, so why do we want to go to the doctor? Because what do we want the doctor to give us? Antibiotics. All right, to give us proper medicine. The ear infection, probably bacterial. We're going to give them antibiotics, and that is going to help clear up the infection. Now, all right, now after she went to the doctor, the doctor, now's a word you've never seen before, but you must look at the pictures again. The doctor suggests a procedure called a myringotomy, all right? A myringotomy, it's very a myringotomy, it always sounds very funny, all right? Myringotomy, okay? A surgical procedure that can help treat the infection. Now we have a look at the diagram alone, and it says to us here, here's the tympanic membrane, now I'm going to use, all right, pink. Here's the tympanic membrane, they cut it open, can you see there, and they put a little tube into that place. Now, if you have studied your defects of the ear, all right, then you should have an idea that myringotomy is a very, very big word for something else. What do you think a myringotomy is? And it is, what is those little tubes? All right, they're grommets. Those are grommets, okay? When you have infection behind your ear, they're going to cut the tympanic membrane they're going to put a tube in and it's going to drain. All right, and that goes to question number two. What do you think is the purpose of the tube? Is to drain the fluid. All right, because what happens is you get all this infection behind your ear, right, and that and obviously keeps coming back. So they cut a little hole in the tympanic membrane. All right, can you see there? They put a little tube through. And what happens is, all the horrible yucky stuff comes out the tube, okay? And when it comes out the tube, it goes onto the pillow. But it alleviates all that yucky pus and whatnot that's in there. And then after a while, that will fall out. As I said, so myringotomy is when they put grommets. Remember I said to you, look at the defects. One of the things for common in children is grommets, okay? All right. So what do you think is the purpose? to drain the fluid so that no infection occurs. Infection. All right, okay. Next question, question number six. Again, related to a defect, a hearing defect. Okay, now I don't know if any of you have seen it, but what they do is, is when somebody has total deafness or very, very deaf, they can put an instrument called a cochlear implant and here's a diagram showing you how it works okay and that cochlear implant is another way it's an it's a mechanical way in which some children are then able to be able to hear okay so let's have a look what is a cochlear implant okay now if you'll notice all right it's a surgery because you have to have it surg surgically put in all right it's a surgical procedure, all right, where an apparatus, because that's what we can call it, is placed onto the skull, all right, if you have a look here, you'll see, look there, it's onto the skull, right, and it goes, we have like a receiver that goes into, all right, the bones of the skull, 
it is going to go to the cochlea. Because remember, if the cochlea doesn't work, we can't hear. So we know it's a surgical procedure where we put an apparatus on the outside of the skull, right, which is then going to right, function so that hearing can be perceived. Now, here are the next two questions. Right, you don't have to know too much about the procedure. We give you the answers. You just need to have a basic idea of how the ear works. It says here, list the parts comprising of the external part. External means outside. All right. So what do we see on the outside? Here we do. We see a microphone and a speech processor and a transmitting coil. All right. So what do we see on the outside? A microphone. Remember that doesn't the rest of the ear doesn't work. We need to amplify. Okay, microphone with a speech transmitter. Okay, let me go back. Speech, all right, processor. There we go. And if we go back over here, a transmitting. Okay, transmitting. So doing all the work that the eardrum would do, the ossicles would do, all right, all the vibrations that are going to happen here, picking up and directing into it. What do you think the function of the receiver is? What is the function of the receiver? Right, what must it pick up? Oh, yes, it must pick up all the sound waves. Or we can say, must pick up the vibrations. All right, and when it picks up the vibrations, where can it send it to? It can send it to the cochlea, all right, and if it can send it to not the cochlea, right, that actually goes to the machine and it will then go to the brain. All right, and once it goes to the brain, they can obviously perceive sound. Right, our time is running out, so I just want to quickly show you that you also need to be prepared, right, for an essay type question. Question number seven, all right, we've asked you here to describe how hearing and balance occurs in the human ear. Now, if you have a look, right, at the model answers, when they are, you need to explain hearing as it starts from the beginning, the, where the sound waves go, all right, from the start to the finish. You have to talk about, all right, the ossicles to the, into the cochlea, mention the organ of corti, mention the cerebrum via the auditory nerve, right, and then you also have to talk about balance. You don't have to go into a detail. Again, just tell me that the fluid moves and then what happens, the ampulla, the saccular, or what kind of differences they, you know, one for gravity, one for position of the head. They then go via to the cerebellum. So be particular. I think we have run out of time. Good luck for your exam grade 12s. Until next time.